He is great. He is worthy to be praised. And this morning, my prayer is that as you gather into this place, no matter where you've come from from this week, or maybe even where you've come from uh, throughout your life, is, is that we find ourselves here in this moment and to realize that, that it's not by accident that we're here, that, that God has a plan, He has a direction. And as we, we begin this new series, we're, we're beginning a new series, Unsung Heroes. And um, someone asked me, if I had the t-shirt, and I don't, but, um, but just imagine, right? But, but unsung, unsung heroes, now, now what is that really? Well, I, I, the best I could, I came up with a definition as I began to look through, um, you know, where we all go, the internet, and, uh, and looked at what is really an unsung hero. And this was the, the definition I kind of put together from a couple of different sources. One who gives, often putting his or her own life at great risk for the greater good of others who does so with little or no recognition. Now, this past week, um, if you turned on the TV, you saw footage uh, from 9-11. And we remembered this, right? It's something that we said as a nation uh, on 9-11, on that very fateful day, that, that we would always remember. And so, so year after year, there's documentary after documentary. And, and I find myself, even though I've watched the same documentaries now for, for years, that I find myself always engrossed, always wanting to, to hear more, and, and always just astounded by all of the heroes that took place in that day. Those that you see that were pulling people out of the buildings, those who you see that were pouring water on the faces of those who were covered in dust, and, and all of these moments where people were truly giving of themselves, Much to the peril, as we would later find out, years past, of all all of the things that have taken place to people's bodies because of where they were in that day, and their unwillingness to leave, but their their willingness to help, and what it has done to them as a result. And they'll never get really the recognition that they deserve on that day. I mean, as much as we try to remember and pull out stories, I was was watching a documentary even yesterday on those who, um, I forget the, the title of it, but it was basically... All of those, because Manhattan sits on an island, people couldn't get off. They, they, they realized that once you shut the bridge down and once you shut the tunnel down, there's no other way off the island. And so they had found themselves on the water's edge. And, and a call went out to any available boats to, to come and to help transport people off of the island. And they said, you know, when they were interviewing one of the captains of one of the ferries, that that is their job to transport people to and from. And they said it was unlike anything we've ever seen or we'll probably ever see, see again. They said within 30 minutes, the skyline was just full of boats and, and fishing boats and, and recreational boats. And it just didn't matter. If someone had a way to get a boat there, they had received the call and they were on their way. And there was just this, this army of boats, hundreds of boats, who were coming to help get people off the island. And they interviewed some of the captains and, and some of the things that were said. And over 500,000 people, just in a few short hours, were evacuated by boats by those who had just shown up. And they, they didn't really know. You know, in that moment, looking, looking at it now, we can say, well, they, they were safe to do that because there was no more attacks coming. But, but in that moment, it was chaos. In that moment, no one really knew that if I go and put my life on the line, I may be risking my own livelihood. But they did it for the sake of others. And even though they'll probably never be spoken of, even though the names will probably never be known of all of those boat captains, of all of those who were riding and who were helping, they were truly unsung heroes. Now, what does that mean biblically? Well, I believe as you read through scriptures, it's easy to kind of have some names pop off the page at you. And typically those that pop off the page, they, they literally popped off because when you're in Sunday school, there was a flannel board and this was na- labeled Noah and this was labeled Moses and this was labeled David. And they, they, they literally jumped off the page and they were such astounding figures throughout history and throughout the, the biblical recognition is that, that they just kind of came to life. And all of a sudden these great monumental heroes of the faith, I mean, we can name them, right? Esther, I mean, we name these, all of these ones and we even like have the things that they say, you know, that, that for such a time as this, maybe it was for me that I was born. You know, all of these moments. And, and if we're not careful... We can look at these great historical figures, these, these great men and women of faith, and we can kind of put them up there and us down here. But, but uh, the New Testament tells us that Elijah, and he was one of those figures, that Elijah was a man just like us. There was no difference in Elijah. I mean, he, he, he walked the same way. He talked the same way. He, he lived the same way. Uh, the, the difference was his relationship 
and his faith in God. It made all of the difference. And as for all of these great heroes of the faith, there's, there's many, if you read throughout Scripture, these unsung heroes of the faith. And here's what's amazing, is that, that you and I have unsung heroes of the faith. That we, when we get to heaven, there's going to be these heroes of faith. That they, they weren't heroes for everyone, but they were definitely heroes in our life. Right? They, I mean, they didn't preach to thousands, but, but, but they preached to us. Or, or they didn't have Bible studies with, with hundreds, you know, but they had Bible study with us. Or they didn't disciple thousands, but they discipled us. And for us, they're truly a hero in the faith, although they may be unsung. And so what I wanted to do over the next few weeks is to dive into Scripture and pull out these people that we typically read over. You know, it's, it's like, you know, certain names catch our attention, and certain names we're always listening to and we're doing Bible studies of. But there's some names that, that just kind of get read over and we really never really know the history of the person. And some of these names that we're going to read over, we really don't know a lot of their history. It, it's not as though they were well documented. We don't know how they, how they came to know the Lord. You know, we don't, we don't, know, we don't, don't have a glimpse into that moment like we do with Paul. I mean, Paul, I mean, everyone knows Paul's salvation story, right? If you grew up in church, you know Paul, you know, used to be Saul. Then he was Paul. He was blinded by the light. You know, it was a song, everything. And, uh, but, but there's this moment where, where we know Paul's story. You know, we, we know the story of, of the disciples when they were called by Jesus. So we, we know the story of David and, and how he's a little boy with a sling. We, we know the story of Elijah. And we, we know all of these stories. But I want to dive into these unsung heroes of the faith. And see what they teach us about our own lives. And how we can really be heroes in the lives of others. Not for glory, but to make an impact in the name of Jesus Christ. So I want you to turn with me, if you would, to the book of Colossians. And in Colossians chapter 1, verse 7, we're going to find the name of a gentleman who we see three times in Scripture. In fact, tw twice, two of those times is found in Colossians. And the Apostle Paul is speaking of him. And then another time is found in the book of Philemon. And Philemon is just one, um, one page, right? So there's no chapters. There's just, there's just one page. It was one letter. And uh, we find him there as, as Paul re references him. But, but the man that which we're talking of, he was a minister of the gospel in the early church. And we pick up with him in Colossians chapter 1, verse 7. The Apostle Paul writing to the church of God in Colossae. And here's what he says. We start in verse 6, 6b. Uh, it says, All over the world this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. And all of a sudden we have this new character enter in. And Paul, I mean, we know Paul. Paul, I mean, if you read through the New Testament, a lot of what you're reading is, is Paul's words, Paul's stories, Paul's leading in his missionary endeavors, churches that Paul planted, churches that Paul invested in. But in this moment, he's writing to a church that he did not plant. In fact, most scholars believe that, that, that uh, Epaphras was one who planted the church of God in Colossae. In fact, some even believe that he not only planted that church of God, but two other church of gods in the regions. One very well known, the church of Laodicea. And as we're looking at these people in which who Paul is writing to, he, he, he begins to explain to them this good news of Jesus Christ. And he says, but, but you know this because you learned it. And the person that you learned it from was Epaphras, our dear fellow servant. Now that's, that's a, a, a powerful phrase. In fact, that phrase is only used two other times to describe people. One of those people is Paul. And another one, he uses that phrase to describe Timothy. And if you don't know who, who Timothy was, Timothy was this young pastor that kind of was raised up in Paul's ministry. In fact, he was saved underneath the teaching of Paul, most like uh, Epaphras probably was. And he became a minister as well. And Paul uses this phrase to describe Timothy in his writings, and he also uses it to describe this young pastor that we really don't know by the name of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. As you study into the life of Epaphras, you won't find a lot in Scripture, but what you do find is in the book of Philemon is that he is, he is in jail with Paul. And so he has come, and, and what we'll find through the writings is that he came to kind of give a report on how the church is doing. 
Because in Epaphras' day, when the church was doing well or when the church was doing poorly, you, you either sent a letter or you went personally to that person and, and we, you had a discussion. You didn't tweet it, right? You didn't, you didn't put it on Facebook for all the world to see. No, you, you had to go and you had to have a conversation. Well, because of Paul's uh, interaction, oftentimes he was found in prison. And so Epaphras goes and he relates this information to Paul to give him encouragement but he also finds himself in prison alongside of Paul. In fact, in Philemon, we hear that it's not only Paul, but it's Luke, and, and it's Epaphras, and it's a, number, a couple of other people who are uh, suffering for the gospel. And so we have this young pastor who, who we realize why Paul would call him this fellow servant of Christ, this, this one who's, who's there, he's doing exactly what Paul's doing. He's giving his life to the message of Jesus Christ, and he's faithful. In fact, faithful to the degree that Paul is faithful, faithful even unto chains, we see Epaphras and his ministry. And Paul is writing to them. And he's helping them understand that the message that they hear, they learned, they understood it by the one who planted that church with this message, and that one is Epaphras. Now, now I had to look up the name Epaphras because that's not, you know, I'm surprising probably to you, but in 2019, it wasn't in the top 10 baby names, right? And, uh, but as I studied Epaphras, what I found that, that if you look at the definition of Epaphras, here's what it means. It means very spirited and very beautiful. And I thought, you know, it's an interesting name for a guy to, to be very beautiful, Right? But then I thought, man, how fitting when you look at Epaphras' life and you lay it alongside of Scripture because Scripture says how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And so Epaphras truly lived up to the definition of his name because he was one as a fellow minister in chains that brought good news. He not only brought good news, he started uh, the good news in regions and began to plant these churches and to tell of the good news of Jesus Christ. He was faithful with that message. So what do we learn from Epaphras? Well, I, th I think the first thing that we begin to learn is to not focus on being famous, but to focus rather on being faithful. Don't, don't, don't focus on being famous. And, and we live in a very selfie culture, right? We live in a very influencer culture. I mean, if you, if you talk to young kids today, it's amazing how their conversation has changed on what they want to be when they grow up. In fact, I was reading an article online and it said that, that an astounding number of people, if you ask them what they want to be when they grow up, they say, I want to be a YouTuber. <laughs> Now you say, well, what? I didn't even know that was an option. Well, what's a YouTuber? Well, a YouTuber is you have your own YouTube channel and, and you make videos and you influence other people. And, and, and the more uh, people that you have who follow you, the more money that you make. And all of a sudden there's this idea, there's this understanding that, that I can be a YouTuber, I can be an influencer, I can be famous. But I think Epaphras would teach us, don't run after being famous, just chase after being faithful in the Lord. In fact, it's what we see through Epaphras. He's not written about. Other than these three times in Scripture, we really don't know a lot about him. No one really writes about his church growth strategies. You know, we just don't hear that from Epaphras. For all we know, Epaphras didn't write a bestseller and then went on a book tour. I mean, we just don't see that in the Gospels. But what we do know is what Paul says of him, he was faithful in his ministry and he gave all that he had and, and as he gives all that he has he wasn't searching for fame you know if you would have asked Epaphras Epaphras what do you want your life to be about what do you hope that you know your 10-year goal your 20-year goal I don't believe Epaphras would have said well I hope that in 2,000 years people are reading about me in God's word I don't think you would have had that I don't even think that would have been on his radar I think what you would have heard, heard Epaphras say is that I hope that people understand the message of Jesus Christ and that they're saved and that they find new life in Christ. It changed me. It can change them. I know that it can. I'll give my life for it if necessary. But I believe that his goal would not to be famous. His goal would have been to be found faithful. And I believe with all of my heart that, that his goal was met. You know, Scripture says how, how precious it is in the sight of the Lord, the death of a saint. And I believe that, that when Epaphras saw the Lord face to face, he heard what we all desire to hear. If you go up as a Christian, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of heaven. 
So we don't focus on being famous. We focus on being faithful. But, but how do you be faithful? Well, I think Paul gives us a little glimpse on the faithfulness that Epaphras had and, and how it was displayed. Remember what we've talked about over the last few weeks is that it really doesn't matter what we believe if it never makes its way to how we behave. <laughs> that how we behave really does help us understand more about what we believe. Because you can't truly believe something without acting on it. And so if you want to know the litmus test, if you truly believe it or not, the, the, the litmus test is, do my actions back up that which I claim with my mouth? And if they do, then you most likely believe it. If they don't, there still may be something that's disconnected. Maybe you say that you believe it. Maybe you would like to believe it, but you, you really just haven't truly put your faith, your trust, your hope in it. Well, we see what... Epaphras truly believes in Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. The apostle Paul is still writing, and as he's closing this letter to the church of God in Colossae, here's what he says. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends his greetings. So Epaphras is with Paul in this moment. And he's in the prison with, with Paul in this moment. And he says this of Epaphras. He says, he is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. You know, as I'm writing this letter, I want you to know something about your pastor. I mean, you know that he's in prison with me. You know that he came to give me uh, the good news of where you had been. He came to ask me questions, and that's why we're, we're kind of rebuttaling these questions about you had about, that you had about faith and that you had about different doctrines, which is all in the book of Colossians. But he says, I want you to know about this, this man that I see day in and day out. I want you to know something because you, you got to know the type of pastor that you have. you got to know the, the type of man that he is because my prayer is that it would not only encourage you, but it, it would challenge you. And here's the type of man that Epaphras is. He's always wrestling in prayer for you. I mean, it's, it's like, I mean, just, not just even daily, but, but almost hourly. I mean, just always, constantly. He's wrestling in prayer, not for other people, not for himself, but, but for you specifically. He's wrestling in prayer for you. And here's what he's praying about. He's not just kind of praying generically. Oh, Lord, we'll just, just bless him. Uh, but he's praying very specifically. And he's praying that you may stand firm in the will of God, mature and fully assured. I mean, if he's prayed it once, he's prayed it a thousand times. You know, just, we, we just, I mean, we, all we hear is Epaphras praying for you constantly. Wrestling in prayer. I mean, you know, you've, you've ever prayed, and then you've wrestled in prayer. And if, you, if, if you've ever experienced the two, you know how great the difference is. Right? For some of us, we've prayed over a meal. And then for some of, some of you, maybe you've prayed for a lost child. For some of you, someone asked you to pray a blessing at the beginning of a program. And then for others of you, you prayed for a spouse that did not know the Lord. And you know the difference. In one, you recite words and you try to sound pleasant and you, you kind of keep it short because you know that there's other things to come. There's a meal, there's a program, there's something that's taking place. You are praying to God, you're, you're speaking to God, but, but it's not with a, a fervency and an intensity. You would definitely not call it wrestling with God. But then maybe you've, you've wrestled in prayer. Maybe, maybe you're in this moment where you just think, if God doesn't come through, it's not going to happen. There's just no way. And God, I just need you to come through in this moment and even as difficult and as hard because I think when Epaphras would look at the church that he had planted and he would see all of the doctrines that were beginning to infuse the city of Colossae. You see, Colossae was a, a trade city. It was on a major trade route. In fact, it's found in modern day Turkey today. And it was this trade route between, you know, the, the uh, uh, Greek area and, and between Jerusalem and there was this great trade route, route through Asia. And because of that trade route, all of these philosophies, all of these doctrines would find themselves in this moment. And, and Epaphras would, would pray and ask God, God, with, without me there, without me there to kind of remind the people, would you remind them of, of your word? Would you remind them of your truth? Would you remind them of the good news that they've received? And that it's in Christ and Christ alone. It's not Christ plus something else. It's just Jesus and his sacrifice. 
Would you remind them what it means to be a believer, to be a child of God, to be a disciple of the Savior? God, would you, would you, would you pour into them? Would you, would you let them be mature in their faith? Not, not infants taking milk always. Not infants who are wrestling continuously with, with bitterness and rage and envy and all of these things that we should be done with as mature believers in Jesus Christ. God, would you, would you work on their behalf? And all of a sudden we find ourselves, we can envision Epiphras wrestling in prayer in a prison cell where he couldn't do anything but pray. You know, sometimes I think that's one of the most precious gifts God gives us because it it shows us where we needed to be in the first place, this dependency upon God. People say, well, all I can do is pray. That's the most powerful thing you have. (laughs) Yes, we can do a lot of things that many people have said after we pray, but we should never do anything before we pray. We should always be going to the Lord. And in some areas, in some instances, we we have to begin to wrestle in prayer for the things that are important. You see, what I believe is that unsung spiritual heroes, they truly care for others. They really care. The the heroes that we're going to look at throughout Scripture the next few weeks, there's going to be one common theme, and you're going to say, man, these people really cared for other people. They, They just weren't in it for themselves. I mean, and we see that with, with typical heroes, but, but, but I mean, when you look at these unsung spiritual heroes of the faith, that, that their lives characterize this idea that, that, Lord, use me. God, if you can use me to impact other people, if you can use me to, to encourage people, to, to help people, God, whatever you want to do, Lord, I just want them to know you. And there's truly a compassion there. And what we're also going to find is that unsung spiritual healers, not only did they truly care for others, but if you really care for others, here's the truth. You truly pray for others. If you want to know if you really care about someone or not, do they find themselves in your prayers? You know, what I found is that the people that I care about the most, it's amazing that they're the most prayed for in my prayer life. And it shows me that there's, there's a difference in the way in which I care for them in the ways in which I care for others. I mean, the, it just shows in my prayer life. I'm just constantly praying. I'm, I'm praying for my wife. I'm praying for my children. I, you know, I'm praying for those that are my, my loved ones. I'm, you, know, you just find yourself cons- consistently praying. And in Epiphras, if you were to look at his prayers and say, okay, let's see who he really cares about. Paul says, I've looked, and it's you. He prays for you daily, constantly. He wrestles in prayer. It's not just a tag on at the end of his prayer. Oh, and bless the church in Colossae. (laughs) He wrestles specifically for you. You see, unsung spiritual heroes, that's what they do. They not only care for others, but they pray for others. In fact, Bobby Redding says this, the amount of time you spend interceding for others is a testimony to the love you have for them. I thought that was powerful. We say we love our church family. How much time do you really intercede for your church family? That, I mean, you really wrestle in prayer. That, that you think about not only the things that you're going through, but also the things that they're going through. And you begin to pray fervently on their behalf. God, God you know their situation. You, you know their lost child. You know their, their lost grandchild. God, you know their marriage situation. Lord, you know their employment situation. And all of a sudden, our, our attention is not fixed upon ourselves because I guarantee you, if I'm in prison and, and falsely accused, accused for something that really is, shouldn't be against the law, I'm just proclaiming my faith. My, my prayer, if it's going to say that I wrestle in prayer, typically in, in my selfish spirit, my prayer would be, God, get me out of here. Lord, you know I'm innocent. God, redeem me. God, God, would you break me? I'll be quoting scripture, everything. I mean, you get get fervent in prayer. But that's not what he's praying about. His eyes are turned towards the people that he loves. His eyes are turned to those brothers and sisters in Christ that he knows that without God, there's no way they're going to stand firm. Without God, there's no way they're going to grow maturity. Without God, there's no way they're going to continue on to fight the good fight of faith. I mean, in some ways, he had to feel sorry for them, even though he was the one in prison, because as he looked around at who he was surrounded by, he's got Paul on one side and Luke, the disciple, on the other. That's pretty good company. 
I mean, it's, it's such good company that, I mean, if you're going to be in prison, you may want to put those two guys down, right? I mean, it's just one of these things to stay encouraged, to be reminded of the faith. Who better than those who were champions of the faith in that day? And Epaphras says, look, I, I, I'm, I'm fine, but I need you, God, to come through for the church. He was in earnest prayer about them. So, so what does that speak to us? How, how does that challenge us? Well, I want to tell you how it challenged me. I believe that as you look at Epaphras' prayer, that he prayed persistent, persevering, and particular prayers. Persistent, persevering, and particular prayers. And, and I just have to challenge myself in my own spirit and say, Jonathan, not just for you, because I'm sure that, that we all pray persistent, persevering, particular prayers for us. <laughs> I mean, like if we're writing out our prayer requests, if someone says, you know, what, what's going on? What do you need prayer for? We can typically give an answer. But do we pray persistent, pers- persevering, particular prayers for other people? Do, 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 we, do we intercede for other people? When things are going good in our life, do, do, we, you know, do we realize that, you know what, they may not be going, going good for someone else? Or when things are going bad in our life, do we realize, you know what, that, that maybe someone else even has it worse. That, that our prayers and our attention is not only upon ourselves, which God says that we are to cast our needs upon Him, to give His Lord this daily bread. So it's not wrong to pray for yourself. It's not wrong to pray specific prayers for yourself. But Aphrophras teaches us that that should not be our entire prayer life. That we should love the way that we say that we love our brothers and sisters in Christ and the way that we show that we love them is to pray for them. Pray persistently. Well, I prayed. It didn't happen. Keep praying. <laughs> Pray perseveringly. You know, I, you know just, well, it just seems like as I'm praying, the opposite is occurring. Keep praying. Wrestle in prayer. Well, I don't know what to say. Well, Scripture says that when we don't know what to say, that the Holy Spirit prays prayers on our behalf with groans too deep to be uttered. So just the very fact that we're calling upon God and just saying, God, I don't even know what to pray. But Lord, you know the need. God, you know the, you know the instance. Lord, and I can assume to know, but God, I just in this moment, and we've all found ourselves there if you've, if you've ever prayed to God, where you know that you need help or you know other people need help, but you don't even have the words to say. Have you ever found yourself in that moment? There's been so many times in my life where I've go, went down to an, uh, an altar of prayer and someone has come alongside me and they said, how, how, how do you want to pray? I said, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how I want to pray. I just know I need God to move. I mean, I mean Epaphras was so wise that he understood the particularities uh, as a minister that, you know what, I need to pray for my people, but not just generically. God bless them, you know. I'm not just kind of throwing some God over to them. I, I'm just, I want to pray specifically. Because as one who had grown up in that Greek culture, as one who had grown up and and been changed by the life of Jesus Christ, but also confronted the doctrines, the opposing doctrines that ruled that day, that ruled that area, he understood if there's one thing that I could pray for them, it would be that they grow in their faith, that they mature as believers, that they don't always limp along expecting someone else to carry them, but pretty soon that they're strong enough not only to walk in their own strength through the power of the Lord, but to carry others alongside a sign of maturity when I was a kid this may have surprised you when I was a kid I I never carried anybody to bed (laughs) ever I can't remember a time as a young child that I ever turned to another young child and go you need help And and I picked them up and carried them to bed why did that come that came through maturity as I, as I became an adult as I became a, a parent now I, I don't need anyone to carry me to bed I'm not laying on the couch going, I'm not moving until someone carries me. You know, it would, I'm staying there, right? But I'm a mature, I'm, I'm, a believe, I'm, I'm an adult. But as I look around me, there's other little people that are not adults. And sometimes they need help. And so just the other night, I, I, I scoop Luke up. And I carry him to bed. I, I love that moment, by the way. <laughs> love it. Elijah won't let me do it anymore. And I just, you know, they, they grow out of it, right? They, they get bigger. And... But there's just something about picking up one and carrying them, and, and you've got them, and you're kind of watching their heads so you don't bang the doors. You know, I'm, I'm not new at this. And, you know, you kind of go through, and then you tuck, lay them down, and you tuck them in. And as I was looking at this series and thinking about our spiritual maturity and the prayers that Epaphras would pray, I just I began to imagine him looking at, his spiritual children, those who had grown up underneath his ministry, and him praying, God, 
Would you help them mature in their faith? So that, that they, 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 they grow up in Jesus Christ. They grow up in their understanding of him. They grow up in the, and they're able to confront these doctrines that are not of him. And they're not so easily swayed by the opinions of man. But they're strong in their faith. And they're so strong that they're able to take other young new believers and, and help them to understand the truth of Jesus Christ. Help them to understand how we're to live and how we're to be as a holy people. That, that they would begin to grow up in their faith. You see, these prayers were very particular. Very specific. And I think it challenges us to pray in the same manner for those that we claim to love. You say, will that, will that really make a difference? <laughs> will, will that really help? Well, well, if you look at Epaphras, he knelt in prayer so that others could stand in faith. He understood that the greatest thing that he could do is to kneel before the Lord and to pray so that others could stand through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I think as, as a hero, and I would define Epaphras as a hero, whether he has the, the fame and the popularity as, as other heroes of the faith, he teaches us something about prayer and about loving other people that I, I just think we, we really don't find to such a degree. I believe it's why God allowed it to be included in his scripture. That, that, that he would show us that, you know, look, if you, if you want to know how to love people, especially church people, if you want to know how to, how to truly care for others, then I want you to be men and women of prayer who intercede, who, who make it a, 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 such a part of their life that others would look at you and say, they're always doing that. I mean, they're always praying for other people. I mean, and not just like generic prayers. I mean, they get very specific. They're just always interceding on behalf of others. Paul concludes his thoughts on Epaphras in Colossians 4.13. He says this, I vouch for him. <laughs> How would you love to have the Apostle Paul vouch for you? I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Heropolis. You see, Herodicea and, and uh, um, Heropolis were, were about 12 miles in relation. There was like a triangle, Colossae and Herodicea, and, uh, or Heropolis and Laodicea, uh, the, you know, with, within a um, day's journey of one another. And, and he says, that, look, I just want you to know about Epaphras. I, I vouch for him. I mean, he's, he's a hard worker, and he's working for you. He, he, he's praying. He's interceding. He, he's doing all he can to make sure that you have all that you need in Jesus Christ. And as I read that, I just thought, how would your work for the Lord be described? Would the Apostle Paul, if, we found ourselves together, would, would, would he look at me and say, you know what, I vouch for him. Man, he, he works hard. And not just for himself. He, he prays consistently. He wrestles in prayer for those that he not only says that he loves, but it shows by his actions that he truly does. And he doesn't just pray generically for them. He prays very specifically that God would strengthen mature, and help them grow in their faith. See, church, I believe that's the type of believers that we're called to be. I believe it's what Epaphras teaches us as one of these unsung heroes of the faith. He, he, he gives us a glimpse into how to intercede for others that I just, I don't see anywhere else to this degree. And it's just a, a powerful glimpse. He wasn't doing it for the fame and fortune. He, he, he wasn't doing it, but, you know, the only reason he was doing it is because he he loved the Lord with God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and he loved his neighbor as himself. And he knew that they needed a relationship like Jesus, like he had a relationship with Jesus. And he knew that if there was one thing that he could give them, it wouldn't be money, it wouldn't be fame, it wouldn't be fortune, it wouldn't be a bigger church building, it would be that they were growing and maturing in their faith. That's the one thing. God, if you give them one thing, give them that. Allow them to receive that. 
Are we doing that for other people? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this moment, for your word. God, I I thank you for showing us just the smallest glimpse into the life of Epaphras. And Lord, there's no doubt in my mind, Lord, the reward that he is receiving because of his faithfulness to you. So Lord, let us not seek fame. Let us seek faithfulness. And Lord, let us not just pray for ourselves. But Lord, let us be those who intercede for others. And let us not just intercede generically. God, I pray that as as men and women of the word, of those who are growing in their faith, that we would take seriously the idea of praying very specifically for others. God, that we would wrestle in prayer. That, Lord, that, that there'd be something inside of us, God, that we would not be okay with just letting others just kind of fall by the wayside. We, but we would just intercede all the more passionately, God, that you would move and that you would break through. God, that you would do that which only you can do. Lord, and we'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor because we know it doesn't happen without you. Lord, we need you. Every hour, we need you. God, we we need your spirit to fill us. Lord, there may be those here today that they they know all about you. God, they've they've believed in you for a long time, but if they were to, to be honest, they wouldn't say that they've been growing in maturity. Lord, that you would challenge us this morning. And Lord, maybe one of the litmus tests for us about whether we've been growing immaturity or not is how we intercede for others does it consume more and more of our prayer life or is it only something we do on occasion god let us pray with the persistence of epiphras in jesus name amen won't you stand this morning these altars are available if you'd like to pray today there's something powerful about making these statements, making these moments, stepping out and praying. And so do you have to pray at an altar? Of course, you don't have to pray at an altar. You can pray wherever you are. But this morning, I just want to encourage you. And we want to do a little bit something differently today. We, we've done this in the past. But you know, if you'd like to pray by yourself, and I, and I understand what that's like. You, you're just not ready to talk about it. You're just not ready to share about it. But, but you know that you just need to come before the Lord. I want to invite you to come to the altar on my right, your left, and just to know that you can kneel down and just to be alone with the Lord in this moment, in the quietness of this moment. But maybe you you need someone to intercede with you. Maybe you just feel like, you know, I just, I know I need prayer. I know I'm not where I need to be. I know there's this thing going on in my life and I don't want to kind of face it on my own. I just need someone to kind of help lead me and guide me in prayer. And if that's you, I want to encourage you to come to the altar on my left or right and know that someone will come and to kneel with you. But wherever you are today, I pray that Epiphras has challenged you like he's challenged me. And that we see this unsung hero with a greater light. Let's sing.